All right, with that, I will get started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we do these demo days on a monthly or bi-monthly basis um, in partnership with TechWadi. If you've had the chance to attend these before, you know I like to keep the introduction uh, as short as possible. Today, we're also really fortunate to have the event sponsored by Silicon Valley Bank. Um, so we'll hear from them briefly as well in this uh, in this introduction, uh, and then get to pitches from our founders. Um, quick thank you to our investor panel. Uh, really lucky to have them participating with us today, uh, giving feedback to the founders, and lucky to have them in the in the Viaca network itself. Uh, quick run through: We have Ela Jerudi. Um, she invests with. XRC Ventures in early stage consumer tech out of New York City. Um, Aboudir Khatan invests uh, across stages and sectors with Dash Ventures and he's uh, Dubai based. Travis Lowry invests with Vinyl Ventures in commerce tech across the US. And Zainab Sharif invests in early stage startups across, uh, across sectors in MENA with Plus VC. Uh, so, Again, just huge thanks to to them all for, um, yeah, giving us two hours of their time and uh, listening to the pitches and giving feedback to our participating startups. For anyone who doesn't know, um, the Viaca Network is a digital community for founders, investors, experts, and tech builders in general with a connection or interest in the MENA region. Um, among other things, we have a members-only Slack workspace that's that's quite active, virtual events like this one, as well as more intimate networking events, um, in-person events as well. Uh, and we recently also started um, offering free workshops to our members from experienced operators and fractional executives. We're actually hoping that our next in-person event will be in Dubai at the Intellect Hub uh, at the side of Jitex, which is a conference coming up in Dubai uh, in a few weeks. So if you're a member of the network or you join after this event, keep an eye out for an invite to that. Today, we're at close to 500 members uh, across the globe. Um, so I'll drop an application link in the Zoom chat as well if you're interested in, in joining us. I also want to quickly shout out uh, our community partner, Tekwedi. Um, for those who aren't familiar, TechWedi is a leading nonprofit organization for MENA's diaspora in tech, particularly in the US. Um, I'm personally on the operating board for TechWedi as well. And we just announced our 2023 annual forum, which is a great event. Um, we gather like 300 to 400 of um, leading tech operators uh, in with relation to MENA or in MENA's diaspora in um, the Bay Area for a day-long conference. Uh, great speakers, great networking opportunity. This is going to be taking place on the 5th of November, um, so in just over a month. Um, and early bird tickets are now available uh, at the, the, the website listed here. If you also just Google um, TechWedi Annual Forum 2023, you'll be able to find uh, find that event page. As I mentioned, um, we're also super grateful today to have Silicon Valley Bank um, supporting the event. I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah Rona um, to just share quickly more about SVB's global engagement and their work with Mina in particular. Um, Sarah, I think you should be co-host so you can- Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Hani. Hi, everyone. Really, really nice to meet you. Um, like Hani said, my name is Sarah Rona, and I head up the MENA market for SVB. I also cover Europe and Australia and New Zealand. Um, as you guys know, SVB had a bit of a bumpy first start to the year, but we were acquired by First Citizens and we're operating as a completely separate entity. Um, very much, you know, still working with our international founders that are expanding over to the U.S., uh, so um, what we do is we help them with their cross-border banking. We connect them with um, investors, with law firms, accounting firms. We really try to be a resource for founders as they're making their way over to the U.S. or raising from U.S. investors, uh, um, helping increase their probability of success and helping them scale in the U.S. So 
I am extremely excited to be covering Mina um, just because I'm from Afghanistan. I spent some time living in Dubai as well. So cannot wait to get back to the region. We're just planning our trip out in November. Um, so yeah, uh, that's it. If you guys have any questions or would like to hear more about how we're working with the region, feel free to um, to email me. I think Hani will send my information afterwards as well, or you guys can uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. But thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'll definitely share your information um, after the event uh, as well. And feel free to drop anything in the chat um, if you'd like. Um, so with that, let's get to our founders. I'm sure everyone will, you know, introduce themselves during their pitch. Um, just wanted to put all the names on the screen once and also just give a quick note on format. So each pitch in its entirety will probably last about 20 minutes. We'll hear from the founder for the first eight to 10 minutes, open up to questions from the investors um, for the, the second half of those 20 minutes. If you're in the audience and you have a question, um, post it in the chat and we'll try to get to it uh, either during those 20 minutes or the founder can come in afterwards uh, and, um, and answer it. Um, I'm also going to be posting two minute warnings in the chat. Um, so try to keep an eye out for those. Um, also, just a note on order. It's kind of here um, going from left to right. So we're going to go Yasin, Arthur. Taya, Adib, and Omar. Um, and yeah, with that, I, I think we're ready, just about ready for you, Yasin, to get started. I'm going to stop sharing, and then uh, um, you should have the controls to share your screen and uh, kick off the pitch. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much, Hani, for uh, number one, organizing this and giving us the opportunity to uh, to meet with all the investors and everything we were doing. Uh, let me know when you guys can see my screen. Price, may I ask what business you have? Computer repair, that is a perfect business yes. to advertise on uh, television. Mute. You know, if you're in the audience, can you be sure to mute yourself? Awesome. Perfect. Uh, uh, yes, can you guys see my screen? We can. We, have the, we have the instructions up. From what I can see, you see. Wait, let me see. I tried. Uh, let me try this again real quick. I don't know what's going on. Oh. Give me one second, guys. I'm sorry about that. All right. I think it works now. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my name is Yasin Kudvabi. I'll just go through my pitch real quick, and then we'll we'll move over to questions that you guys might have. Uh, my name is Yasin Kudvabi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hasil. Uh, Hasil is an AI-driven B2B procurement marketplace where we service the B2B end users, so the offices and the factories around Pakistan, and then we hope to expand that into the region. Uh, starting with the problem statement as to why we created Hustle, how it came into existence, what we saw within our own respective organizations, my co-founders and I, was that we saw a lot of irregularities and inefficiencies that come within our, our own uh, organizations when we look at the procurement of the products that we consume in our own offices. The products that came in had no transparency and visibility from the uh for the management to know what was going on all the sourcing that was happening was haphazard some were bought you know online some came from marketplaces and so again there wasn't a cohesive place where we could get anything from there was a lot of time money and effort that was spent into everything that was going that was coming into the organization and we saw that we couldn't make the decisions that that needed to be made for us to be successful in our organizations because these small uh, procurement products just kept us occupied so often. Uh, when my co-founder Hadi and I discussed these problems, we thought that this was a problem that no one had addressed. So we went out into the markets to ask other companies around the country and around the city as to whether this was a problem that they were facing themselves. And the majority of the time, the response that we got was, yes, this is an issue and it should be addressed. So we set out to create a cohesive solution that 
would be AI driven. It would allow customers to not just get the products that they required for their own consumption, but it would be a one-stop solution for everything that they needed. Uh, it had to be where the products that you wanted for your office and for your workspace were uh, ordered through a singular platform, uh, through a one-click solution where the ordering was beyond effortless and it didn't take any time whatsoever and didn't take an effort. Uh, billing had to be efficient where it had to be connected with whether you're back in ERP or it could just be an, uh, an uploadable CSV that could be uploaded into your preferred accounting system. Uh, it had to be data-driven where your in management could look at that information and then have that information available to them so that they could make the decisions that needed to be made for their organization to be successful. We wanted delivery to be user-defined uh, so that the last mile delivery was when the customer needed it at the right time, at the right place. And we wanted to work with our vendors or with our clients on the payment terms of their choosing because every organization has their own respective payment terms. Some work on cash basis, some work on spot payments, some work on a 15 or 30 day credit. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the organizations that we work with are comfortable with the services that they're getting and the products that they're getting and aren't being pushed into making decisions that they don't have to. So we wanted to see how big the market opportunity was. When we looked at this market size, just in Pakistan alone, we saw that all in all, there was about a two, $6 billion market size with the products that we wanted to offer. We wanted to start with the daily essentials piece, which includes products that are consumed in an office on a regular basis and are purchased on a month over month basis that don't require a lot of thinking and are very repetitive. Next, we wanted to get into corporate gifting. That is the piece where we get a lot of our GMB from, and it also is the piece where we get most of our margins from. Those are the products that come every so often based on patterns of gifting. And those are the ones that keep our customers stuck to us. Lastly, we wanted to go into ad hoc supplies because we wanted to be a one-stop solution for everything that businesses needed. We needed to make sure that whatever businesses wanted could get, could get they could get from us. So for that, we wanted to create a marketplace where we could connect our buyers and vendors for the products that they needed and just provide a one-stop solution for everything that they wanted. So with that, we saw that just Pakistan alone had the market size of about $6 billion. And when we go beyond Pakistan into the rest of Asia or just in the Middle East region, it was a significantly larger market size. Uh, with that, uh, we introduced Hassel. Hassel is an AI and data driven B2B procurement marketplace that is on a mission to revolutionize the industry. What we wanted to introduce, like I said, was number one, daily essentials. We've created an AI enabled one click ordering system that allows corporates to order their pantry janitorial uh, products, over the counter medication and stationary items in one solution. What we've done is that we use the data that we have for our clients to create the optimal order for them, just so they don't have to spend any time whatsoever figuring out what the products that they require are at the right quantities. And we can recommend a cart to them that uh, reduces the time that they spend creating a cart significantly, ensuring that they can spend more time on what's actually important and not on the stuff that they really don't want to do. Uh, next, we offer ad hoc supplies, which include products that are used on a regular basis, but aren't bought on a regular basis. That includes products like your office chairs, your laptops, your uh, ACs. Finally, customized goods. Those are the products that really give us a lot of our margins. Those are products where we can come back to our customers, make sure that they can get the products that they require and are exactly to their likings. With our team, of experts, we can make sure that happens for our customers. Uh, value proposition for our stakeholders as to why they love working with us. Uh, a very, very short and simple answer to this is convenience. What we offer to them is convenience. They love coming to work with us because they know that they get a streamlined procurement method. They get cost efficient pricing. They get exceptional service. They get data back decision-making. Uh, they get a one-click ordering platform uh, they get a wide variety of products that aren't generally available in the markets that they go out to. Uh, predictive ordering, again, makes it very, very easy and convenient to get the products that they need. 
Uh, they have the option to customize the products that they require without having to go out and speak to multiple vendors or multiple partners. And they get digital invoicing, which is a big problem here in Pakistan. Next, why do vendors love working with us? It's because we provide them with information and we provide them with feedback. Uh, they get uh, they get access to a lot of sales opportunities that they didn't have before. When you talk about onboarding your product to one of the largest supermarkets in the city or the country, you have to pay a lot of fees. With us, they just onboard their product to us. And with our data-driven recommendation engine, their product gets pushed to the customers if the product is recommended by other customers. So they know that if their product is good enough, they don't have to spend a ton of money to get that in front of customers and to the customers we make that for them. And they love that about us. Second, we provide them with data. They understand that the product that they're selling does have feedback, but it's really hard to get feedback from traditional retail channels. We provide that to our vendors and let them know what products are successful and what aren't. And that allows them to either focus on the products that they're doing well on or to enhance the products that aren't doing well to make sure that they can get the products in front of the customers as they want them. Uh, how we're using AI and data analytics, like I said, uh, it's we're making it as convenient for our customers as possible. We're using data and analytics to understand our customers' requirements and the trends that are coming out into the markets to make sure our customers get the right products at the right time and their ordering process is made effortless. We use generative AI or we're planning to use generative AI to start recommending products to our customers. So let's say a customer wants to order customized gifts for executives that, that are their clients, and they can write that in, uh, in a chat GPT plugin that we'll have on our website, and they can start getting recommendations. They can even start seeing vendors of the products that will be made for them. It'll give them a better idea of what's available, what can be done within their constrained budgets, and how that can be made successful. Using that technology will make our customers come back over and over again. It'll allow, us, it'll allow them to be more comfortable with us because they'll know that the products that they're getting are based on information and data that we've collected over time and it'll increase the chance of successes for those conversions to come in. Similarly, uh, using supplier, uh, dynamic supplier management platforms, we can work with our suppliers to make sure that suppliers that work with us that allow us to get the best rates that allow us to have the best credit lines, that allow us to have the best products, will always get preferred treatments and it'll allow us to succeed in our success and our suppliers to succeed with us. Uh, this is a very basic case study of what we go through on a daily basis and how our flywheel comes into effect. Uh, Dastagir is one of the largest startups in Pakistan. We serve them as a customer. We got onboarded with them when they moved into their first office out of a co-working space and for them, Getting their office supplies was a big hassle because they'd never done it before. So they reached out to us and said, you know, we have no idea if you guys can help us create the default cart. That'd be amazing. So we looked at their requirements, recommended a cart to them. We got onboarded. That started to give us a GMV of about 98,000 rupees, which is right about $300 uh, every month. That keeps on coming back over and over again. We started to have a relationship with them and then they... Uh, in those relationships and conversations, we told them about the other categories that we have to offer, uh, like our customized goods products. When we, during our conversations, we found out that they're going to hire a lot more people. And we found out that they have these customized gift boxes that they give out to their customers, told them about those products. And uh, they asked us for a quotation, went back to them with the right pricing and the right samples. And they approved that. That gave us about you know, 208,000 worth of orders, which is right about $1,000 that came into us. After that, uh, we continued to work with them over and over again. And their existing teams came back saying, hey, we want new notebooks and new water bottles. So that turned into another order. Uh, they saw that the service that they were getting from us was so good and the information and the data that we were getting from us was so relevant that they onboarded us into their warehouse without us having to do really any effort to onboard a new client, adding another level of revenue that came into the organization. Uh, the best thing that happened with this the gear was that when their onboarding boxes were sent out to some of their key stakeholders, they saw the products that they received, liked them so much that those key stakeholders then reached out to us to make similar boxes for their organization. Again, adding almost 525,000 rupees to our uh, top line GMV and then adding that to uh, our bottom line as well. And we've seen this you go 
over and over again, time and time again with a lot of our customers where when they start with us once, they generally do tend to come back because they love the service that they're getting. They love the personal touch that they receive and they love working with us because they know that if something goes wrong, we're here to support them, which is not a common practice Absolutely. in markets like Pakistan. You've seen uh, uh, monitors. You want to just, we're, we're hitting uh, the time limit. Do you want to kind of like wrap things up in, in a minute or so? Yeah, for sure. Uh, how we make money, it's very simple. We keep a margin in everything we sell. There's no fee to the customer. And how we can expand that is including uh, adding more products and advertising to uh, the marketplace. A competitive landscape, uh, there's very few digital players. A few of them are working towards getting into this space. But right now, uh, Jugnu Pro was the only one that they sadly shut down a few months ago. Uh, who has succeeded around the world? A few in the Middle East include uh, Noon, which recently include, uh, added uh, B2B uh, products. And then Easy, WCube, and Mogwix are all part of the Asia region as well. Uh, meet the team. I myself, Yasin Kadabi, Hadi Dabani, who's our chief technology officer. Uh, we all have a deep background in uh, the spaces that we have decided to cover. And it has uh, turned out really well for us so far. Our traction so far, we have over $100,000 in total GMV. Our cash conversion cycle is right about 15 days. Our average days on entry is right about at seven. Customer retention is at an amazing 98% where we see our customers stick with us. Our average gross profit margin has gone up to 6.2 uh, uh, over our lifetime. Uh, but that started with about three and is at about nine right now. And we're seeing that grow over time as well because of that recommendation piece as well. Our 24 month plan, uh, we uh, have launched our MVP and we plan to expand to Dubai uh, in the Middle East as soon as, as early as uh, the beginning of next year. And then we plan to expand into more countries as time goes on. Uh, what we need the funds for, 30% will go to working capital requirements, 15% will go to CapEx and OpEx, 5% will be for marketing, and then 20% will be for the development of our uh, AI tech. And uh, these are a few of our financial projections. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks. I, think I went a little bit over. You're good. Um, I'm going to just add uh, the investor panel to like spotlight them with you. Um, but feel free, everyone, uh, all of the investors to jump in if you have uh, questions for Yasin. I'm happy to start. Hi, happy. Thank you for oh, your pitch. Ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, it's fine. Uh, thanks, Yasin, for your pitch. I uh, wanted to ask about um, your target customers. Um, who are they and how many vendors do you have? Are you just B2B or do you have a B2C angle as well? Uh, we're just B2B. Our target customers are organizations that are the SMBs within the country. So we generally work with uh, organizations that go anywhere from 20 to about 350 employees. And our um, preferred vendors right now, we, about, we have about 35 different vendors uh, that range anywhere from uh, you know, small wholesalers all the way up to manufacturers. Okay, and um, on the revenue model, I think you mentioned you take a take rate. What's the average take rate that you would take on every order? So, yeah, so uh, right now, our our last month's average was right about 9.5%. Uh, for daily essentials, that's right about 8%. For customized goods, it's about 20%. And for ad hoc, because that's a more of a marketplace model, it's about three and a half to five percent, depending on who the vendor is and our relationship with them. And what's the average order value per customer that you've seen uh, so far? For, yeah, so for daily essentials, it's about three hundred dollars on average, and that's continuing to go up as we onboard more larger customers. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just give you some comments. No, no questions specifically, but more comments on, on the pitch so far. So first and foremost, you mentioned um, wanting to internationally expand to Dubai next year, but you're operating in the fifth most populous country in the world. There's no need to think yeah. about international expansion until you dominate that market. Um, 
the requirements to expand into a new market often mean founders moving moving there and, and having to find someone to put the sort of home market on autopilot. That takes time and resources. And when you're an early stage startup, dominate the market ahead of you and then go internationally. Um, the second thing I would say is obviously it's good to see a product development roadmap. It means you have an eye on where you want to go in the future. But again, um, when you go off to sort of launch a business and be like a super app and have so many different services that you're offering your customers, again, that's stretching your resources unnecessarily very early on. And more importantly, you are widely opening up the competitive landscape. So if you do one thing really well, which can be B2B procurement at first, dominate that. And then by doing that and listening to your customers and seeing what the natural next progression is, whether it's financing, whether it's you know invoicing, whatever it is, then launch your additional services like that, as opposed to just trying to build everything out at once and making the competitive landscape a lot bigger. And then one thing is, as well is when you represent traction on your slides, putting just an absolute number of like 100K GMV does not provide enough context. What you should always do is show that growth across whether it's GMV orders, margins, show development over time. Because even if the absolute number is small, if you're demonstrating within the first couple of months that you're growing sustainably, not these crazy, you know, 40, 50% rates that everyone thought pre COVID, that's more enticing for an investor, right? Because that means you're picking up steam in a more sustainable way. Um, and I think that was, those were my only comments. And thank you for that. I know those, those definitely do um, make a lot of sense and I'll take those into consideration for, uh, for the future as well. Thank you. Pleasure. But we just, uh, for, for further context, we just made our first investment in Pakistan um, about 18 months ago and it's a phenomenal company. So one of the things we always, we, we deal with a lot is that the traction has become so so impressive there and the need to, to sort of show off that we can demonstrate in multiple markets obviously raises the pool of capital you can you can raise from international investors but it's such a large market and in spite of all the economic conditions at the moment there's so much value you can extract just from pakistan itself so don't don't rush to go into new markets until you think you're actually ready yeah no i agree with that and that that was the initial goal when we started but what we realized very soon enough was that uh the the convenience factor really does play a lot into international markets because labor is so cheap here when we work in Pakistan. We have to be price competitive to a very, very, you know, minute level. People look at the smallest amounts and that does become a challenge for us because our motto has always been to have a gross profit positive and not, you know, obviously undercut the competitors by bearing a loss. Uh, what we saw when we did started doing some research about international markets, especially like the Middle East, was that convenience is something that people generally are comfortable paying for, right? So when we look at markets like the UAE and Saudi and elsewhere, we can add a layer of, you know, that convenience fee or that additional fee that can be translated into better margins for us and help us uh, grow that a little bit better. No, I completely agree. I think you, if you, if you set up, if you start a business and your, your strategy to, um, to outperform your competitors is on price. It's, it's a failing game, right? Cause then someone else just comes yeah. and undercuts you. So I'm with you completely. Obviously, as long as you can continue to, to deliver an excellent product, you can afford to charge more, but just uh, doing so in, in, in the natural scope of expansion and not rushing it. Definitely makes sense. Hey, Essen, thank you for your pitch. Uh, I actually have a question Hi. on, um, so we were talking about convenience just now. What is like the inconvenient route that your customers are using right now to procure the same supplies? And are there any roadblocks to address in the sense that you're saying you're bringing in different types of products, like you have the dailies and then you have your gifting and your customized products. Are, are you hitting any roadblocks with being able to procure and ship all of those under one umbrella? Yeah, so, so let's talk about like the general, like, uh, process that a company has to go through to get the product that they need, right? Uh, the general product is that someone from the administration department or from someone from the organization has to create a manual list of the product that they require because there's really not one cohesive place where they can get all their office supplies from. And even if there are, there's still that, because we're still in that early stage of e-commerce within Pakistan, there is that level of trust that's still needed within organizations to be able to get the products. Secondly, most... Uh, e-commerce companies cater to that B2C client and not provide the tax, uh, you know, data collection that organizations require for them to be able to be more tax compliant. 
Uh, so that becomes a roadblock for them. So when they have to get the product, they either have to go directly to the wholesalers or to the uh, to the uh, distributors to get that the the right products at the right price, or they have to send out men with physical cash in their hands to the markets to get the products, which obviously becomes a risk for the person carrying the cash. And then there's also that factor of someone having to go into the markets and get the products, get it loaded onto a truck, and then inbound, like inbound it into your into your uh, facility. Uh, what we offer is a like I said, no one has to really make an effort into writing the list that they have with our platform. They can do it on a single click, where it saves them a lot of time, and they don't have to send out someone. And we don't deal in cash, so that allows them to exercise some of the credit facilities that they have available. Uh, the second part with regards to the customized goods piece, uh, because again, there isn't one solution to get all the products that they need for those customized products to get a single product, like a single box, let's say the one we got made for Dust the Gear. Uh, there's six products in that one box and there's about a dozen vendors you have to deal with because every piece of that box comes from a different vendor. And then the printing and services are, are done by someone else. So if someone wants to do that on their own, they most definitely could. But then finding the right vendor, making sure that the right vendor can provide the right quality, getting all the sampling done, going to the right vendors, uh, payments, pricing, all of that stuff is a real challenge. And you really need to know where to get that stuff from. Mm -hmm. We have those relationships with our vendors where we already vetted all the vendors to make sure that the products that we provide are at the right quality as per the customer's requirements. So we do constant sampling and making sure that you know, the customer gets exactly what they need. If they're not satisfied with the product, we take that product back and have it exchanged with, you know, whatever they need that satisfies them. So the convenience that we really offer is a peace of mind, right? That the product I'm going to be receiving is going to be on time. It's going to be asked for my specifications and asked for my likings. Um, and then they have to deal with someone who, you know, understands their organization structure and their requirements and their, you know, level of intellect versus someone who, you know, obviously is in the markets and doesn't have those facilities or those features available. As far as us having to deal with vendors, uh, no doubt, uh, you know, as rightfully pointed out by Abdul, that we do face challenges working with so many vendors for all of these different products that we're offering. But because we've been doing this for almost a year, we have those relationships with our vendors where most of our work can be done over the phone or one of our uh, one of our team members is so comfortable with them, they can go sit down with them, have a cup of tea and have that relationship built where the work gets done exactly how we want them without us having to face too many problems. Every now and again, obviously there are those issues that do pop up, but generally it's gotten a lot more comfortable that we can do that uh, you know, successfully. And we've seen our customers come back time and time again for you know, different products because they they enjoy this the convenience that they get sorry guys um we're gonna have to wrap this one up and move on to the next one um travis if you have questions feel free to drop them in the chat or send them over to yasin directly just want to make sure that everyone has time but thank you so much yasin for for sharing um next up we're gonna go to arthur who's Thanks, gonna guys. chat about lemonade um Arthur, you should have the ability, I think, to, uh, as soon as you see you stop sharing, uh, Arthur, you should be able to take over. Awesome. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Arthur Bizdikian. It's very nice to be here. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Laminate Fashion, where we're actually changing the way social and commerce are interacting together. Because today, if you look at the world, social media or commerce on social media is a nightmare and everyone is paying the price for it, whether it's the brands, the content creators, the influencers or the users. And the reason is because today you don't have a full funnel solution, which means we use platforms like Instagram and TikTok for awareness and consideration, but we end up doing all of our checkouts or everything that has to do with conversion on different platforms. Now, this is creating multiple issues. First of all, we have a lot of misaligned purpose, which means as a user, when I open up Instagram, my intention is not to shop. I'm always on Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube because I want to be entertained or because I want to see content from my friends or I want to see what they're up to. 
Second, there's a lot of unfair competition for the brands because as a brand, you are competing against every single industry on the planet. So if you're a fashion brand, you're actually competing against Pepsi, you're competing against Mercedes, you're competing against Persil, but you're also competing against my mom's cooking. So my, if my mom is a good cook and she wants to post that on social media and boost it, then as a brand, you're competing against her advertising budget as well. Third, we have a lot of monetization struggles on the platform, and this has really been highlighted in the last two years, ever since the whole privacy policies kicked in. And we have zero control because Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you know, they have algorithms that benefit their interests. And brands and influencers are always complaining about that because they keep on changing them. And it's always a win-lose situation, which means for Instagram to make money, as a brand, you have to spend money on advertising. Because if organically you're doing well on social media, then you do not need to spend money and Instagram and TikTok lose. So that's why it's always a win-lose situation. And on average, the cost of advertising on these platforms has gone up by more than 120% over the last 24 months alone. That's why we created Lemonade. It's a go-to platform where you can actually tell a story and sell a product in a very seamless way, where both of the experiences, whether it's a social experience or the comms experience, are integrated together, creating a full funnel solution. So on the platform, you can actually swipe through videos as if it's Instagram or TikTok, but you can directly buy any product that you see in the content from the content itself. So you can directly select the size, do a quick ad, it gets added to your cart, and then you can do a full checkout. You also have a discover page where you can discover products through fil sorry, through filters, through categories, through lifestyle, through artists, through different influencers as well. And each brand has their own page where they can actually upload all of their products, or they can even upload them automatically through KPI integrations with their own inventory management systems. And they can also have all of their posts related in one page. We also give them uh, value-based verifications. So instead of giving them the generic blue badge, we actually verify them based on their values. So it can be verified as a cruelty-free brand, a woman-owned business, a recyclable brand. And those values are very important, especially today, because the world is going towards more transparency. And the common consumer today, or the younger consumer today, actually wants to know who made their products and why they should be supporting those vendors or those creators. And the platform is very decentralized. So we also empower the creator economy. So the cool thing about Lemonade is that as a user or as an influencer, I can also create content. But when I, can, can, when I create content, I can actually tag the product of the brand within my own content. And then people, my followers can buy it from me but the order goes to the brand. And as a content creator, I automatically monetize that. So if today, for example, I create a video of me wearing this t-shirt, I can actually post it on Lemonade, tag this t-shirt, and then anytime my followers are buying it, the brand receives the order and I take my commission. And the entire thing is powered by AI, but the AI that we use is more for personalization and also to give recommendations on the type of products that they want to buy. But the very cool thing that we have is actually the data and the analytics, because we're the only platform that actually combines the data of the two behaviors. We have a full end-to-end -end tracking on how a single user interacts both with content and with commerce. So we know which videos, which content interests you, but we also see which products you're buying and how that entire journey is connected to each other. But for the brands, the very powerful thing is that our platform allows every single user that they have to turn into their ambassadors. So once I buy from a brand, I can also become the spokesperson. And then as a brand, I have the full data analytics to be able to track all of that. So the brands, the influencers, and the content creators, they each have a set of their own data so that they can monitor their business, which makes us today the only platform where you can actually do product placement campaigns and third-party content. And this is a full funnel platform from awareness to consideration to conversion in one single platform. Today, we are actually finalizing a partnership with Beatport. So Beatport is the biggest platform for electronic music. They have more than 40 million monthly active users. 
1.1 million DJs on the platform, including David Guetta and Peggy Goo. So Beatport and Lemonade are doing a partnership where all of their merchandise and all of their DJs are being onboarded on our platform. Because on New Year's Eve, Beatport is doing six global events live. And in these events, they're doing exclusive merchandise drop. And all of those six events are actually streamed through the Lemonade platform with all of the merchandise that are going to drop on the Lemonade platform. And that will be the kickstart of our partnership. In 2024, we have about 16 events that we're doing together. The way we make money is that we actually have a revenue share model. So we have, for the brands, we take 17% commission plus the payment gateway fee. And for enterprise level brands, we actually take 7.5% commission with the payment gateway fee. In year two, we're gonna start doing the in-app ads, but those are gonna be more boosted type of ads. So brands that are not on the platform cannot actually create content there. And it's a very big market because on a global level, you have more than 290 million sellers worldwide. And the timing is really cool because today everything is actually going towards video. So Spotify a couple of months ago actually announced that they're releasing the video integration in their platform because it's easier to discover content and artists. Because of the Spotify video, we actually reached Beatport because we have the same investor. So I was talking to our investor, I told him, hey, Spotify is doing this. How can we get to Spotify? Because every artist has merchandise in their video. It would be interesting for them to monetize that. So introduced us to the founder of Beatport and then Beatport decided to work with us instead. Etsy now just released a video first experience and Amazon as well just released a video first experience. But what makes us unique is that we actually combine the social and the commerce together. And we're very focused in the world of fashion, beauty, and lifestyle. What makes us different from Instagram, from TikTok, from YouTube, first, most importantly, is the intent. Because my intention as a user on Instagram, even if they add shopping, is I am always there to be entertained first. Whereas on Lemonade, I'm always there for commerce first. And the social element that we added is to build up the community around fashion and the community around commerce. Because as a brand, you, you need an entire community to be able to sell. You need content creators, you need influencers, you need product reviewers, you need photographers, you need storytellers. So Lemonade actually brings in that entire community on their one platform. Before creating this new platform, we actually used to be a marketplace for emerging designers. We had more than 400 designers back then. We grew by 500% within our first year and had the GMV that exceeded a million dollars in our first two years. But that's where we started noticing all of the problems that we had when we were connecting commerce and content together. At some point, we worked with more than 62 influencers that had close to 100 million followers combined. And at that point, we decided that we wanted to take control of our content. So we created an MV a new MVP where we took all of the content that we create on social media and put them on our app and connected products to it. And that's where our investors called us. They're like, hey, this is really cool, but this is no longer a marketplace for emerging designers. This is actually a social commerce platform. Let's explore that angle. And that actually worked really well. Today, we have close to 700 brands. We have huge partnerships in the pipeline. We just got accepted into Hub 71's incentive program. So we're joining them in October and they're also investing in us. My co-founder right now is in Saudi Arabia, where we are closing a partnership with the Ministry of Culture for the Riyadh Fashion Week that they're doing in October. And we're also in 2024 going to be supporting the top Saudi fashion brands. We've raised around a million dollars in our pre-seed. We're actually backed by senior executives at Meta, at Google, at Turo. And we also raised investment from Tim Draper in the US. We also bank with SVB. And uh, we're currently doing our seed round where we're looking to raise $5 million so that we can actually grow our tech team, but also increase our community. The aim over the next two years is to hit 10 million active users. We have a very strong team, both in retail and in technology. My co-founder, Dana, is an award-winning fashion designer. She's also a small celebrity in the region. Mo used to work at Google and has a master's in computer science from Oxford. Nadim has more than 30 years of experience as a global fashion executive. So he's the one that launched Fasonable. He owns luxury stores around the world. He was on Fashion Stars in Dubai, but he's also the ex-general manager of Elisab. 
And Zoe, I don't know if you can see her, she's at the end. She's our chief happiness officer. She has six years of experience and giving you hugs and licking faces. And I think my slides froze. Yes. So thank you for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I'll turn it over to the uh, to the investors. Travis, I don't since you didn't get a chance uh, to ask a question last time, do you want to kick things off? Yeah. Um, so as you look at uh, Instagram and TikTok's attempt to commoditize the content that they have, TikTok being relatively more successful than Instagram, what are like what's your like key learnings there of what they did right? and what they did wrong, where you're going to be able to move in and start to take some market share. So the funny thing is that we actually work with the, the ex-managing director of Facebook for the Mina is our investor and the senior, um, the senior director of engineering of Facebook that has been with them since 2008 is also an advisor. So they're working closely with us to make this happen. One of the biggest problems that Instagram and TikTok had is, first of all, the legacy architecture that they have as a platform. So they were they had built an eight year long social media platform and then decided to add commerce. So that's why the commerce was very uh, hacky, which means you don't directly have inventory on the platform itself. On Facebook, for example, you have to upload the catalog to Facebook, then take it from Facebook, send it to Instagram. Some items get approved, some don't get approved. And then when you want to check out, you're sending traffic to a different platform. So the first issue was the legacy architecture. But the biggest problem that Facebook and Instagram face is what is the purpose of the platform? When you're on Instagram or TikTok, what are you there to do? Are you there to shop or are you there to be entertained? So as a platform, what are the algorithms that I'm building? Am I pushing commerce or am I pushing entertainment towards my users? And as entertainment platforms and social platforms, the answer is always social. So that's why commerce for them always takes a back burner. So if I'm on Instagram and I'm swiping because I want to be entertained and I see a product, maybe I'll add it you know, to my favorites. Maybe I'll check it out. But the problem, even if I check it out, it's on the Instagram browser which means it doesn't really add it to my cart, add it to my basket, add it to my favorites. So whenever I'm in the shopping mood, I'm not going to Instagram for inspiration, right? I'm looking for e-commerce platforms. So that was the biggest issue that they faced. And that's why these platforms today are looking at our platform because we are commerce first. So we're commerce first. And the social media aspect that we added was to complement that. So that we can create the trends around it, we can talk about lifestyle, we can talk about styling, we can recommend products, and influencers are loving it. So currently we're signing up influencers every single day and big celebrities every single day, because on TikTok and Instagram, they have a certain aesthetic that they have to follow because now they're known for that aesthetic. So if I'm a comedian, I'm not going to suddenly start creating content on Instagram around shopping, because that ruins why my followers are following me. But if I come to Lemonade, I'm not going to create funny sketches. It's not the platform for that. Here, I can actually show my lifestyle. I can show what do I use as products on a given day? What type of mascara do I put? What are the beauty products? How do I get dressed? And the best part, you can do cross uh, brand integration because I don't need to sell it to you as, as an influencer. I don't need to tell you, hey, please use my promo code or check link in bio. No, I just create a video. I'm like, hey guys, those are the products that I use every single day. And all you have to do is just tag these products and then people can just add them to cart and buy them. And as an influencer, you get compensated for that from the platform. I'm sorry for the very long answer. <laughs> hey, Arthur, a quick question. First of all, thanks for the SVB plug. Second of all, I'd love to hear your thoughts from a competitive landscape. I'm asking because um, one of my clients is called Miss Tyler. They're an Australian company and they have a really similar operating model. So I think there might be some synergies and collaboration opportunities. Happy to make an introduction. Um, let me just paste it in here. They basically have created a similar uh, e-commerce platform that allows as a woman to look at people who have similar sizing to you. You follow them. They're content creators they put a link to certain stores and then you can buy it directly on the site they're also leveraging another client of ours is carted.com c-a-r-t-e-d.com from like an e-commerce um, checking out perspective so everything is done into one platform 
Uh, I just wanted to happy to make an introduction if helpful. I think that there might be some really good synergies here. Uh, it's also reducing like carbon footprint from like um, a returns perspective and promoting a bit of like positivity from like, you know, the female shopper landscape. So take a look, um, but yeah, I would love to hear sort of how you're thinking of things from a competitive lens. Yeah, that, that is amazing. So I'll definitely check them out. I think you and I are connected on LinkedIn. So I'll text you there for the intros. That would be really cool. Um, again, I'm sure there are a lot of people doing somehow similar things. We haven't seen anyone that is doing the, the full integration the way we have done it. Uh, because we built it fully as a social and commerce integrated together from scratch. We have seen platforms that are doing bits and pieces of it, but because they're not offering the full funnel experience, they were never able to actually get the big brands to use it on their own, which means today, for example, we're closing deals with some of the biggest retailers. We've had meetings with L'Oreal. We've had meetings with, I don't want to name drop right now because we're we're closing these partnerships as we speak, but the reason why they're looking at our platform is because for them, it feels like a very seamless experience, right? It seems like an experience where, oh, it feels like I'm actually on an on a TikTok or an Instagram that is completely built for consumers and for commerce. So the know-how of, of them using the platform is easy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the best answer I can give you because I haven't okay. seen the platforms that you've sent me. So once I check them out, I can give you a more um in-depth answer but again we're currently collaborating with a lot of different platforms because we never believed in building the full solution ourselves we wanted to build the main engine which we have but now we're actually onboarding different platforms that add services and then they're able to through our platform offer these services both to our vendors and to our influencers and to our users is that things out there Thanks, arthur Sarah. um Super interesting pitch. And I think you also articulated the answer to Travis's question very well. Um, made it very clear to understand why you actually are different to some of these platforms from just a structural technical level. A question um, about dynamic pricing. So as an influencer, I go on, I have, let's say, a million followers. You have 100,000 followers. We post a, a shirt from the same brand. Is someone who gets better conversion rewarded more? And how can you also further incentivize influencers, celebrities, whatever you want to call them, onto the platform to naturally uh, sell. I see you're smiling, so I think you have a rehearsed answer for this. Uh, it's a, it's actually fine. So this is a multi-level answer. Um, with the influencers, we work on different things. First of all, when we're doing now the big launch, uh, the influencers have their own promo code for the app downloads. So if as an influencer, you get, let's say 100,000 app downloads, these 100,000 app downloads, they're your community. Anytime they spend money on the platform, you actually monetize that and you make a percentage. Now that percentage gets given to you by the Lemonade Commission. So whatever commission we take from the brands, there's around 30% of that that is allocated to the creators. It's split between, we call this the community commission, right? So this is where you can actually build up your community. We created this because this is one of the reasons why the influencers are coming to us now without getting paid up front. Because they're like, oh, wait, I can monetize my community forever. Yes, sign me up without you know asking for $50,000, which is working really well. Second, we have the direct sale commission. So let's say as an influencer, I create content and someone's buying. I make a direct commission, but this commission goes directly from the lemonade percentage. So you don't even need to have a collaboration with the brand. But as a brand, you have all of your dashboards. So what we do as lemonade in the dashboards, we actually tell you as a brand, hey brand, your top creator in Saudi Arabia is this person. We would advise you to give them an extra incentive of 3% or 5% because that would incentivize them even more. And then they can actually do that through our platform because we have all of the, the splits, the commission splits, and the accounting is already built in. So they don't need side agreements. They can actually do a smart contract on the platform with the start date, end date, and so on. As a brand, you can actually send out a message to all of the creators that are connected to you and telling them, hey, everyone, for the next month, we're going to give you an extra 10% commission on every transaction so you can either mass it or you can be selective so you can either select an individual as a brand and give them this extra incentive or you can do it on a massive level as a company we actually try to facilitate that a lot so we try to find synergies between our brands and our influencers and actually put them together 
So our influencers now are constantly getting PR packages as gifts from the influencers. They're getting extra incentives. They're giving extra incentives to the influencers and so on. So it's a it's a community effect. We're trying to, you know, make it as automated as possible, especially through the dashboards and connecting them. But that's why I was smiling because I love the community effect and we always saw it as a community platform because we want it to be decentralized. That's the only way where we get out of the cost of acquisition game. Because if we're always going to be playing the game of, oh, we need to spend this much on Facebook, you know, to get new customers, it doesn't make sense. But if our community is, you know, self-building, we should be the platform where people spend their advertising budget, right? So yeah. that's I, don't, I mean, I don't want to dominate. The, I, I, could, I could push back and discuss this at length, but I'll let someone else ask a question. We'll connect after this for sure. Yeah, okay. I think we have time for like one quick question if anyone wants to I just have a question on the back of uh, Abudi's um, question in terms of uh, conversion. So with the brands having their own page with the content versus the influencers tagging them, how have you seen the conversion of customers through the influencers versus directly on the brand's page? So basically, to what extent uh, does Lemonade rely on those influencers? Um, I think it's, I would love to have a very, you know, detailed answer for that, uh, but the, the app is still relatively new. So we, while we are getting a lot of conversion, we don't have very specific differentiators yet because it really depends on what's happening. Sometimes you have a brand that is out influencing the influencers because as a brand name, they're stronger. So people would directly buy through them. And in other cases, you have influencers that are creating cool content and people are being inspired by that content to buy. So it's still a bit premature, but the, the good thing is that we allow both of them to do it. So both brands and influencers are creating their, their content. But I do have to say that the majority of the content right now is still brand-driven content because we're doing the big launch event in on New Year's Eve, actually, with Beatport. So that is when we're doing the big release of our influencers and content creators. Today, we have about 100 that are already signed up, but over the next couple of months, we have a couple of thousand that are actually subscribing. Okay, and one more question, uh, if there's time. Um, are you targeting designer brands with a higher order value, or do you plan to target um, smaller order values as well? Um, no, so we're actually targeting both and we create very clear distinctions for them on the platform through the filters, the collections and the categories. But we are in conversations with big designers like Ziad Nakad that have, you know, that has, you know, that has a presence in Paris Fashion Week and so on that sells outfits starting $10,000 to half a million. But you also have, you know, socks that cost you $12 and you have everything in between. We're, you know, talking to L'Oreal. Uh, L'Oreal are very close to signing with us. We have the other big retailers. We have a meeting with Asadea on Friday as well. So you have the different um, brands. And, and the reason why we're doing it this way is because all of the brands are on Instagram. They're just not selling there. So what we see is that all of the brands should be on Lemonade, but they can also sell there. Our job is to make sure we create the proper filtering process, personalization process, and navigation process on the platform so that you have an easy experience of finding the products that you're looking for within the price range and within the occasion that you're interested in. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. I'm going to have to cut it there, but of course, continue the conversation uh, offline if, if you can. Um, Taya, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Taya, you're up next. So um, why don't you, yeah, get things started. Perfect. And a great segue into what we do. So really awesome to see social commerce. I would love to find a way to collaborate as well, by the way. So we are building the future of what we call relational commerce, where we enable any brand or business to deliver live virtual consultations on their website and convert their web traffic into real customers. I like to say it's the simplicity of a phone call backed by the power of your e-commerce. In addition to this, we're also building out an AI component to analyze the sales conversations as well. So in essence, and I love the question from Zainab around the type of segments, because what does cars, real estate, or luxury goods have in common when you buy? 
Chatbot experiences today are quite limited and quite frustrating. And what we focus on is the more high value items or consultative sales, where you usually have a lot of questions before you buy. And that's where we come in. That human element, that trust is very important in the sales process. And for brands today, there is a big disconnect between what happens physically and what happens online. In fact, to the point earlier that was made, 70% of customers research online before they usually purchase offline today. So there's a big research gap happening as well where brands are not seeing the full customer journey. Again, the majority of customers are quite frustrated with chatbots. In fact, 86% of us are quite frustrated with chatbots, especially within these segments. So how can we make this more real, more personalized and create that trust in the digital customer journey? Again, the disconnect for brands is there, connecting what's happening offline and online, but also the people in the sales team physically in the stores are not incentivized to sell online and vice versa. There's a big sort of silo within this gap. So how can you use your and leverage your existing sales team to also service your online customers, especially when there's low foot traffic in the store or in the showroom, how can you leverage them to service your online visitors? So brands really struggle to connect the physical and the digital seamlessly. That's where we come in as Get B. And here is a real use case with Lacoste. So here on any brand or any website, you can brand it as a service. You can talk directly to, let's call it a stylist or a consultant straight away. And it will actually start a real video call. Let me just show you a recording as we're talking here. So you can capture phone numbers, emails, data, convert them into a sales call. And here you can actually talk to the shop front. So I can showcase different products in real time. And I can also recommend products and add it to your cart. So we've linked this back end to Shopify, all the other big sort of e-commerce brands and tools as well. So you can create carts in real time and pay for a product or service during a live video call, saving you a lot of hassle going into the mall. In fact, here, just going back, the beauty here is that the conversion rate improves by around 20 to 30%, which is the same conversion rate we see in a physical store. As well, the average order value goes up by up to 40%, because the ability to cross sell and upsell is quite high. Of course, you can capture unique insights from these conversations and reduce customer returns. So it's really exciting to see how people use this in different segments that are more consultative in nature. For the salesperson or for the actual sort of person on the shop floor, we've launched a dedicated iOS and Android app so as I said before, it's like the simplicity of a call backed by the power of your e-commerce. So you have a full suite of sales tools, just right accessible anywhere, anytime. This enables you to leverage your existing sales force and also create the future of work or hybrid work as well. So you can leverage them and offer them flexible ways to work too, answer sales calls and track all of their sales activities. We are linked directly to CRMs like Salesforce. Again, we can pull your inventory from platforms like Shopify. So you have all these tools at your convenience. You can be online and receive direct calls, or you can also offer virtual appointments, sort of like a built-in Calendly system as well. Again, it's a seamless transition between online and offline, where you can leverage your physical team to service your online customers. But the most interesting, I think, for brands here is the full transparency on data and analytics. So today you can already analyze, you know, how long the calls lasted for, who's your best performing sale team, ratings, reviews, what products are recommended versus bought. You can track and analyze absolutely everything. And we've already started prototyping our AI piece where we're transcribing the actual conversation and analyzing the conversation as well. And we have different categories within the segments that we're looking at. So here, what we're building out in the vision is to say, okay, what questions are people asking before they buy? This is really relevant data, not just for the salespeople, but also for your marketing teams, brands, and so on. And this is a product that we're looking to upsell next year as well, as we're building it out. Yes. In terms of segmentation and how we're looking at the landscape today, live stream shopping was a big trend that happened in China, especially that came out of COVID. So if you look at live stream shopping, it's more like a, an interactive webinar sort of TV shopping. 
Um, but what we're doing is really focusing on the one-to-one -one consultation. And this is great for segmentations within luxury, vintage, used cars, furniture, jewelry, wellness, real estate. And we have use cases with each, within each segment. This is where people have a lot of questions before they buy. And there's a lot of insecurity before they buy online. So having the ability to talk directly to somebody at the brand or at the store can make a big difference. So as I like to say, it's any kind of emotional purchase. This makes a big change, both in the conversion rates, but also in the average basket value. Our closest competitor, Hero, got acquired by Klarna. They raised a $10 million Series A, and within six months got acquired for 150. They're now plugged into the Klarna ecosystem. So we see this space growing relatively fast as well. So it's a very exciting space to be in. We have some great use cases and proud to also mention that we're in Arabic, English, French, Portuguese, Italian. So this is very scalable as we're a pure SaaS platform. Here's a case study with Dermalogica. We see higher average basket value, the ability to cross sell and upsell, customer satisfaction rates. People are really happy with the service and they keep coming back for the service, which is also great for loyalty and retention. And of course the conversion rate compared to just buying online without this kind of service. The core pillars of Dermalogica is personalization, as she's explaining here as well, and educating the customer. And this is a way for them to create that human touch, that personalization directly for their digital customers. So it's really great to see brands like Dermalogica use this and other interesting brands in the different sectors that we're working with. Happy to share more case studies later and have some live examples to show you too. Our business model today, we're a pure SaaS, so we sell a license fee depending on the number of salespeople or stores, if it's an enterprise agreement, that you have within your brand. So it's a very simple model for people to, to understand and to test. We've tested different pricing options, and this is the best sort of solution that we found. We don't take any percent or commission on sales today, just a flat fee or license fee. Today, we can recognize $200,000 in ARR, and we have an upsell within our existing accounts of 700,000, which we're currently negotiating. The average contract value per brand today is around 15,000 in ARR. We've obviously closed larger and, um, sorry, somebody's trying to come in here, <laughs> admit, uh, larger and smaller accounts, uh, which is great because we can capture the small to medium accounts quickly. These are five to $10,000 ARR contracts, as well as enterprise. In fact, we just closed a famous Kandora brand today in Saudi, and um, it's it's a really nice use case because, again, they're starting at a 5K ARR, but there's an upsell to up to 40K. So it's really interesting to also see the upsell potential within these accounts. It's like to scale. It's a SaaS, so we can deploy within one to two days. Technically speaking, if everything's set up, it's actually a matter of minutes. But of course, there's always some branding questions involved. One thing that's really important to mention and very proud to share as well, we just got accepted into the global Microsoft Pegasus program. Now, for those of you who are familiar, Pegasus is a global initiative where out of 30,000 startups, they've selected 100. And out of those 100, I'm proud to share that we are the first and only one selected from the Middle East. I'm proud to also be a female founder representing the Middle East as well. I just come back from a month in New York where we kicked off our partnership with them. And that's a two-year program where they're actually coasting us to strategic accounts. So that's a very exciting program. They take only 3% in terms of the transaction. But the beauty here is we're now part of the Microsoft ecosystem. So let's say they sell us to a Bloomingdale's. Bloomingdale's can acquire us directly from Microsoft. It skips a lot of legal procurement and hassle. So it's a really amazing program to be a part of. And we're excited to kick that off now as well. We're integrated into the big platforms like Vitex, Shopify, and have commercial partnerships there as well. It's a massive market that's growing fast. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the commerce space, but a quick sort of highlight that I wanna share here is that 20% of major commerce today is on e-commerce or is digitized. So although it's a massive space, there's also a lot of potential to grow. So it's exciting to be a part of that digital transformation for a lot of our customers as well. We're an amazing team that is diverse, international and values based. Very proud to share, we also have a very strong board of international advisors too. 
I myself am a third time founder, half Arab, half Norwegian. So it's also very important for me to create global success stories for and from the Middle East. That's why I decided to start here. I previously had an exit from my previous company as well, and proud to have a very diverse and international team. We're hybrid today, half of the team is in the Middle East and half of the team is in Europe. We have a very strong technical team and the majority of our team today is actually the tech team. So we're also raising a round to kind of grow the commercial side, especially now with the Microsoft partnerships in place. We also have Dr. Ali Baghdadi, who is the chairman of our board. He's been in the AI and machine learning space since the 80s. So before it was cool, he also sits as um, a vice president in Ingram Micro, a Fortune 100 company as well. So having his insights also as we're building out this AI piece is critical for us too. Hey, Taya, we're at about time. Um, so could you? Uh... Just to wrap up quickly, we're raising an extension of our existing round, but we're also looking for new customers. So if there's any customers or portfolio companies that you think we should reach out to or work with, we'd be happy to talk to them too. If there's more in the appendix, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for today. Awesome, thank you. Ayla, do you wanna get started? Yeah, sure. Hi, Thea, thank you for the presentation. I honestly, I completely agree that there's a need for face-to-face -face interaction with certain like, more sensitive bespoke purchases, especially when they're high basket prices. I have a question more on logistics. I'm trying to wrap my head around. With these sure. virtual consults, who's speaking? Is it the salesperson who would normally be in the store? Or is it off-premises employees like a call center agent? Depends on the brand and how they're set up. So mm -hmm. we've serviced both some brands who are just e-com only, and they have a dedicated service team who are sales focused. They work remotely. And then we've also worked with brands who have physical stores and an online presence. So we can service both. So depending on how the brand has set it up, it's whoever answers the sales conversations and we enable them to do that digitally as well. So just to clarify, it's not like our salespeople doing the sales on the brand's behalf, yeah. but they leverage their existing sales team. Yeah. Okay. So there is the option to have a remote and an in-person worker. Exactly. And because everything is tracked from a data perspective, it's great for the brand because then they can see, you know, who's performing the best, what's working, what's not working, et cetera. So it allows that flexibility as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then my other question was, how long is your average sales cycle with existing accounts so far? Depends on the, the size of the customer. I would say a medium-sized account between 15 to 20 ARR is anywhere between three to four months. Of course, enterprise can be longer. And we've had some shorter sales cycles as well that have been two to three weeks. Usually um, American customers are a lot quicker. Um, Middle East takes a little bit longer in the negotiation. So depending on segment and geography, we've, I would say the average is three to four months. And then who's usually the representative you're in contact with during sales? Someone who's in charge of revenue. So not someone who's just e-commerce specific. So someone who's above e-commerce because they see the connection between physical and digital. So mm -hmm. either like a, a CIO, I would say, or a CMO because they're in charge of both. Usually it depends on the organizational structure, but definitely someone who's high enough up who sees both the physical and the digital element is our ideal customer profile. Okay, cool. That's all for me. Thank you. I'm happy to ask. I feel like I've been dominating, so I'm gonna let someone else ask unless no one has a question, I can go. All right. Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, first and foremost, is the goal when you, as a consumer, I now log on to, let's say, a Zara website and I'm connected with um, a, a prospective uh, seller there. Number one, assuming the person working at Zara can just log in from their phone and do it there. There doesn't have to get any hardware, any sort of requirements there, correct? Exactly. Okay. And two, the goal is then not to necessarily turn them into an e-commerce order online, but actually to get them in store and then cross sell and upsell there. Or what's what what's the sort of value add you're selling to the rents? So here it's leveraging your existing sales team. I'm just gonna show a recorded video as I talk through it. Here you can leverage your existing sales team to answer that call that's coming in. So leveraging them in store. And here I can show you products in real time. 
but I can also recommend because it's linked to the, the e-commerce, I can recommend an add to your cart in real time as well. So you can actually sell virtually. So you have all the sales tools just on your phone as a salesperson. So that enables you to sell in store, or if you want to offer like a hybrid remote work option, you have that ability as well, because you have your e-commerce linked to those calls too. And everything is tracked for you as a salesperson. So you're guaranteed your commission. And so your the business model is essentially that the companies are paying per employee or per salesperson per location, whatever it is, which means they're always going to know what the yes. right amount of employees is so that no customer ever feels like they logged on and they can't speak to a, to a client, correct? Exactly. And if they don't have anyone available for whatever reason, it will switch to a booking system. So you can schedule virtual appointments as well. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Um, just to add this, um, I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the investors because we're investors in GetV. Um, oh, maybe Thea, you could highlight a bit on the sales uh, sales team app um, and the different conversions for or value add for every sector. Yeah, so it's very exciting to see the different sectors. Again, any kind of consultative sale, this makes a lot of sense because it's automatically also linked to like your CRM, to your backend ecosystem with the products. So I can easily recommend in real time during a video call. We've seen this work with cars. So in the, in the segment of cars, if you think about the last time you bought a car, you probably already knew the model or the type of car that you wanted. Now where a, a dealership will win is in experience. So if you call a dealership and nobody answers or it's complicated to schedule a test drive, you're not gonna end up there. But if you have this solution and you can quickly call the dealership, see the car virtually, you're more likely to book a test drive in 70% of customers who book a test drive will then buy the car. So for example, in the in the case of cars, it's making sure you win in customer experience and service to get people to test drive. That's their key KPI. Even though that being said, some brands here in the Middle East are actually on Shopify. So you can add deposits or you can add payments also in the virtual call as well. When it comes to luxury, skincare and, and other product, sort of smaller products, if that makes sense, the average basket value again goes up by close to 40%. And the conversion rate when you're on a call is 20 to 30%, which is similar to in-store. Keep in mind, online e-commerce today alone is only 1% to 2%. So again, it's interesting to see that conversion rate within retail. We just launched a vertical for real estate, especially off-plan real estate, because a lot of these companies today have Calendly, then Zoom, and then their CRM. We sync all of that for them on their website, and they can convert and capture the leads in real time too. So again, any kind of consultative sale where talking to a person makes a big difference in terms of trust, that's where we come in. Our goal is to facilitate human connection through technology and not replace it. 